Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the Institute. Uh, very pleased to welcome you all to this IIA seminar. We're joined today by Tony Connolly, who's known to probably everybody in the room, Europe editor for RT News, and we're delighted Tony's taken the time to come to Dublin uh, at this really important time for Irish-UK and indeed UK-EU relations. Tony will speak to us in the usual format for about 20 minutes, and this will be followed by questions and answers with you, our audience. We're especially delighted to be joined by such a group here at IIA headquarters in central Dublin. And those of you who are with us will be able to contribute to the discussion by raising your hands. Those of you who are at home will be able to join the discussion by using the Q&A function on Zoom, which will be familiar to everybody. Please feel free to send in your questions throughout the session as they occur to you, and we'll get to as many of them as possible. Please keep questions as concise as possible, and please introduce yourself and also mention any affiliations you have if you feel they're relevant. Finally, a reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record, and please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. I'll now formally introduce our speaker before handing over to him. Tony Connolly is the current Europe editor at RTE. Born in County Antrim and raised in Derry, Tony began his journalism career at the Derry Journal and the Oxford Courier. He joined RTE News in 1994, where he's held a variety of roles, becoming Europe correspondent in 2001 before becoming Europe editor in 2011. In that time, Tony has reported extensively from around Europe. Most recently, many of you will have followed Tony's excellent reporting from Ukraine following the Russian invasion. Indeed, I remember speaking to Tony uh, on the 14th of February last year when we were meant to speak together at a panel in Oxford, or in Cambridge rather, and you were deployed to Ukraine less than 10 days before the invasion, which is a rather sobering thought. Tony won an ESB National Media Award in 1998 and a second one in 2001. In the campaigning and social issues category, Tony is also the author of two books, don't Mention the Wars, A Journey Through European Stereotypes from 2009, and Brexit in Ireland from 2017, which has entered the canon of books about the UK's withdrawal that everyone should read. Tony lives in Brussels with his wife and two young sons. Tony, it's always a pleasure. The floor is yours for the next 20 minutes or so. Let's turn you around. Thank you very much, Barry, and um, thanks to the organizers of today's event. It's, it's always a pleasure to come over to Dublin, um, any excuse, I say. Uh, and uh, it's really a great honor to be here and, and to meet some old friends as well, uh, people I've known from various locations. Um, so what I'd like to do is, I, I was here, I think, in November, and I, I gave an update at that point on the progress or lack thereof in, in the negotiations. And I was trying to get a sense of, of when or whether a deal might be done. Um, so now I'm here on the other side of the, the famous Windsor framework and nobody I think could have predicted um, things would turn out like they did. Um, so I'd, I'd like to give a little bit of a run up to how the deal was actually done. And then I'll, I'll try and go through the main bits of the deal. And as a special treat, I will try and explain the Stormont break, which is the the, the issue um, which seems to get every, keep everybody awake at night. Um, so when I was here in November, yeah, there were we we had this famous reset. We had this moment of optimism. The very short-lived Liz Truss uh, premiership, um, which feels like a bit of a fever dream at this stage, and she was replaced by Rishi Sunak. And we had a, a key meeting of the British Irish Association. British Irish Association in Oxford, I think, which amplified this idea of, of, a, of a new beginning, a, a reset in relations. Um, but nobody really knew what was driving this optimism, like what, what exactly had changed. Um, I, think, I think it was clear, even when Liz Truss was Prime Minister, that she had been the author of the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill largely in order to get elected uh, as leader of the Conservative Party. And once she was elected, there was a feeling that she could then take a more pragmatic approach. Um, Rishi Sunak obviously took over and he was, a, you know, a, a different personality. 
from an EU point of view, I think it was important that he didn't have any of the fingerprints uh, on the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. He, he was known as cautious, um, meticulous, um, and he struck up quite a good relationship with Ursula von der Leyen, the European Commission president. Um, so you had this new framing of, of the, the, the controversy over the protocol um, and you had then a period of very detailed negotiations at technical level. Um, but, but the amazing thing uh, is that between September and a couple of weeks ago, the technical talks were done in such secrecy. I mean, I, I was told yesterday by someone who's fairly close to things that um, outside of the two negotiating teams, there were maybe four or five people who knew exactly what was going on. And this, this was... Um, a remarkable achievement, I think, by both sides. Uh, now, on the on the Brussels side of things, um, they were worried that if anything leaked out about what the EU was agreeing to uh, in terms of compromises, that the it, it would just draw magnetic heat from the ERG or the DUP, and then the the the, the thing would lose momentum. Um, so you had a, a quite an unusual situation where. The European Commission was not really briefing member states beyond generalities. Um, that, was, that was a problem for people like me because just the way the thing is structured uh, in Brussels, the, the Commission will brief member states either through co-repair, through ambassadors, or the uh, what's called the working party. It's, a, it's, a, it's basically the, the member states' Brexit councillors. Uh, and that that's where you, as a journalist, that's where I would try and get information about what's happening. But but they were only being briefed in generality. So like nobody really knew uh, what was going on. Like we knew that, I mean, I knew from my own contacts that the European Commission was going to be more generous beyond what we call the October 2021 papers, which in themselves had um, offered a range of flexibilities, um, you know, a, a reduced um, data set, um, this new legislation on medicines. But we didn't know beyond that much, much detail. Um, wh where this really broke through was on the 9th of January, um, when actually an announcement that took a lot of member states by surprise, um, James Cleverly and Mara Shevchevich met and they announced they had reached an agreement on data um, so in other words, this idea that the EU would uh, have access to a blend of databases uh, provided by um, HMRC, the UK customs arm, but not, not exclusively HRC, there were other commercial data streams as well. This was a kind of a synthesized bespoke data access system that the EU could plug their risk analysis tools into to see forensically what was coming into Northern Ireland from Great Britain. Um, so that, that this turns out to have been very key for two reasons. One was it allowed the EU to shift its cursor on the whole question of risk. I mean, the, the mantra we've had from the EU from the beginning is they don't want any risk to the single market. Um, the UK's mantra was, you know, it, it's not helpful to have a a single rigid paradigm of risk where you have a set of rigid rules and then everybody has to agree to them. Why not have a more flexible attitude to risk, which means you can you can tighten the degree of checks and controls as you need to as the risk arises. Um, and the data access agreement not only provided that cover for the EU to do that, in other words, you, you would have a whole range of safeguards including the knowledge of what's coming in. You could see day-to-day, um, hour-to-hour, what's coming in uh, in terms of consignments. There would be like a drag-and-drop functionality to look at patterns that might emerge that, that would throw up suspicions. And then if, if something suspect did appear or look like it was appearing, you could then pull a lorry over for, for checks. Go away, sorry. I'm actually reading off my phone, so... Uh, um, so um, yeah, so so that was that was, that was an important breakthrough. But also, um, once both sides managed to get that breakthrough, I think it brought forward a real determination to to do this. You know, they, they, this gave the process real momentum. Um, I, I like for talking to British officials last week, 
I was asking, like, you know, where did you feel that the EU had taken a big step towards the UK? And I think that the view in London was that the, 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 there was a bit of a mental leap from the European Commission to, to accept the idea that this wasn't a, the, the classic sort of orthodox version of, of the single market that was being applied in Northern Ireland. It was something different. Um, you, you couldn't necessarily graft an orthodox set of rules onto a, a contested space like Northern Ireland uh, and expect everything to be okay. Um, and I think that the commission did, did move in, into that mental space where they could say, okay, first of all, the lived experience that we've had of the protocol over the past couple of years shows that there isn't necessarily a huge risk to the single market. And secondly, now we have these safeguards. And you know, the safeguards are, are substantial. Um, so, so there was, um, you know, a, but a, a lot of this was still fairly subterranean. And what, what we now can accept, I guess, is that, is that we were in a tunnel all that time. People were saying, when's the tunnel going to start? But I think we were actually in the tunnel because the tunnel means um, there's very little information getting out. Um, and I've, I've heard tell of, of negotiators who didn't see friends for months because they did not want to be asked about what, what was going on uh, in the talks. So um, we have, um, so the, the deal was done then on, on Monday a week ago, um, uh, sorry, Monday fortnight ago, and the, it, there was a strange kind of choreography because the, the, the view in Brussels was that the, the, the deal had been done and was ready to go for some time. It was all about a question of timing as to when Rishi Sunak, the UK Prime Minister, could jump and how he would be able to manage his own party and, and manage the DUP. Now, on the 16th of February, um, special advisors and Darnington were ringing journalists to say it's going to happen on Monday or Tuesday. And suddenly Monday and Tuesday came along and it, it didn't happen. Um, and that Sunday you had Boris Johnson uh, on manoeuvres uh, talking about how he he wouldn't necessarily go to the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. Um, so I think Rishi Sunak had to do some party management uh, and that's why it got delayed uh, for a week. Uh, but when, when it appeared, you know, like clearly this was a big deal. Um, you know, there, there were lots of big ticket items here. We knew about the red lane and green lane uh, option, um, which would deal with goods coming from Great Britain into Northern Ireland. The green lane for goods that are clearly staying in Northern Ireland, the red lane for goods that are going on to the single market. How you differentiate those, how you have a much broader trusted trader scheme, um, which means that, again, all the time you're whittling down the need for checks and controls and, and paperwork. Um, we had a, a big concession on state aid and VAT um, on uh, excise rates for alcohol. Um, then you had all the kind of smaller scale, but but um, you know culturally and in terms of consumers, important issues like parcels, uh, seed potatoes, um, plants. So suddenly, from a position last year where you know, there there was still the standoff between the EU and the UK. Both, both teams had managed through all of those months, like from September to, to, to February, to actually work through all of these. Um, and the, the, I think what they have produced is, is very clever. Um, it's clever because it, it, it provides the UK with the ability to say there is no longer an Irish Sea border. And you know, according to UK officials, that, that had to be their, their, their main prize in these talks. Could they look unionists in the eye and say, there's no longer an Irish Sea border? And could they say to consumers that the food that you get in Great Britain and the rest of the UK, you can also get that food in Northern Ireland? And then another highly emotive issue uh, medicines. So they managed to uh, forge a, a partnership uh, on these issues where you had those big prizes for Rishi Sunak to say, and you know, these, these things are very clear. They're very easily articulated to, to ordinary people and, and to unionists. And you could see how Rishi Sunak did that on the day. Um, 
I mean, it did lead to accusations that both sides were putting their own gloss on what had been achieved. Um, but I mean, talking to senior people in Brussels before it happened, they said, look, we're not particularly bothered about how the UK wants to present this. Everybody knew that the important thing was that, that this would look attractive to, to the DUP. Um, so the, of course, the big issue was the, the storm and break. Um, and this this got a lot of attention immediately because a lot of people have been expecting the EU to do something on the role of the ECJ. And when they saw the storm and break uh, element to it, they thought that that was somehow going to replace the ECJ. And I remember listening into a, a technical briefing uh, by commission officials, and there were a lot of questions about the storm and break, and people kept saying, sorry, we don't understand how this relates to the ECJ. Um, but to try and explain the storm and break, um, it's it, it relates really to um, what's already in the protocol. And it's a very clever device because it borrows from the Good Friday Agreement. It borrows this petition of concern from the Good Friday Agreement. And I've talked to member states, officials in Brussels who said, they like this idea because it gives um, you know, it gives a bit of ownership back to to the UK and, and to unionists that you know their their concerns have been met. The the petition of concern uh, in the Good Friday Agreement was really initially designed to deal with um, you know cultural identity concerns, uh, probably more for nationalists than unionists back in in 1998. Things like um, you know perhaps flags, emblems, uh, language rights, and so on. But what they've done is they've taken that concept and converted it into a mechanism in this new uh, improved protocol. So what, is, what, what does the Storm and Break deal with? Well, it deals with um, EU regulations for goods, right? So in the original protocol, you have uh, Article 13, which basically articulates how the EU single market rules for goods will apply in Northern Ireland after, after Brexit. So initially under Article 13.3, about 1,200 regulations a year, EU regulations would get rolled over automatically, uh, either through amendments or through updates, okay? Now this is a fairly routine uh, process at single market level. Um, I think the term is a implementing legislation that the EU has. It's like secondary legislation. It means that um, regulations governing a whole range of things in the single market just get, get updated or amended, and it's done automatically. And Article 13.3 of the protocol um, meant that, that those updates would happen automatically in Northern Ireland. There wouldn't be any debate. Uh, it would just be uh, de facto happening in Northern Ireland. Article 13.4 was a bit of a safeguard for the UK. It, it dealt with new regulations that the EU had proposed and brought into play. Um, because these weren't regulations that were being updated, these are brand new regulations, then the UK could look at these and say, well, we don't like this uh, or we don't like that, and here are the reasons. And then you would get into this process through the Joint Committee. Um, and it, would, you know, it wouldn't be by any means a... Uh, a slam dunk for the UK to have something blocked. There would have to be very good reasons for it. And it, it might go to arbitration if there was a dispute over those reasons. Um, so what the storm and break does is it gives uh, the assembly through this petition of concern. So if you've got 30 MLAs from two, at least two parties, they can ask the UK to, to challenge not 13.4, but 13.3. So Article uh, regulations that are being updated or amended. Um, so, it, as as officials say, it, it it flips Article 13 into Article 13. Sorry, it flips Article 13.3 into Article 13.4. Um, if that's sounding too technical, my apologies. But essentially, it just means that the UK has a a mechanism to stop stuff being updated, as well as a mechanism to stop brand new regulations. I mean, that's as as simple as I could put it. Um, so the question then is, you know, what are these regulations and, and why would, would the Northern Ireland MLAs suddenly decide they want to block a regulation being updated? 
So they reckon there are about 1,200 regulations are updated or amended every year. Uh, 900 of these are generally non-controversial, but there might be about 300 which are um, might cause concern to businesses in Northern Ireland. So the best way to explain this is to is to take examples. So a very an example came to the fore very quickly in the week after the winter break, and that was um, arsenic in baby food. Um, who knew <laughs> they put arsenic in baby food? Uh, but there you are, that the EU brought in a regulation that would cut arsenic levels by 80%. Um, so the question is, what would that mean in real terms for the storm and break? Um, this was uh, an updated regulation. Um, I suppose the, the appeal to unionists um, of the storm and break, apart from the symbolic value of having something that overcomes this, this quote-unquote democratic deficit. Um, but it also, I mean, for unionists as well, the whole question of divergence between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK is obviously a very keen one. Um, and really, the storm and break is about divergence, how you manage divergence. So if the EU is making, um, reducing the levels of arsenic in baby food, by a substantial amount and the UK isn't, then what does that mean for, for those goods going from Great Britain to Northern Ireland? Um, so very quickly, the Northern Ireland food um, industry came out and said, we would prefer to stick with the higher safety levels. So immediately you see this impulse not to have a race to the bottom. Uh, you, 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 in, in that particular example, the impulse is we will stick with the higher um, the higher safety margin. Um, that would mean that food, baby food coming from Great Britain into Northern Ireland can still be consumed because under this Windsor framework, you do have a kind of a dual regulatory system. There are areas where UK public health rules are deemed adequate. Um, but if Northern Ireland food producers wanted to export ingredients or baby baby uh, food, then they would not be able to use those ingredients in the UK, uh, and they would have to meet uh, these particular standards. So, so then, you know, the, this storm and break opens up a really fascinating discussion on um, on divergence and whether whether this storm and break is at its heart something that actually keeps the UK aligned with the EU um, rather than a, a, div a divergence over time. The, 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 the key about the storm and break is that, as you know, it, it can only be used in very exceptional circumstances at the last minute. Uh, MLAs would have to go through a whole architecture of consultations with various bodies. You've got the specialized committee, you've got, um, there, there's a new subcommittee has been set up um, they would have to engage with civil society, with Northern Ireland business. Um, when you see all the um, prerequisites and caveats that are associated with the storm and break, it's almost like it is designed deliberately not to ever be used um, because the, 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 hurt, the bar is set very high to, for it to take effect. And MLAs must register their objections within two months of, of the regulation becoming law in the EU's official journal. So then you get into a question is, well, how is the Northern Ireland system equipped to do this kind of uh, analysis and, and to get a consensus on whether to pull the storm and break uh, in the first place? Um, is there a capacity? Is there, is there the capacity in the Northern Ireland civil service in the, in the assembly? Um, within the business community in, in the European Commission. So, so what the storm and break does, and I think that's why this, this thing is very clever, it, it locks both sides into a much more collaborative process to make sure that stuff doesn't blow up. Um, you know, suddenly if there's a, a particular regulation that causes a whole sector of goods not to be transferred to Northern Ireland, um, then You've got you've got trouble, um, and I think there is an inbuilt suspicion that that people in the, in the DUP, for example, 
will want to trigger the storm and break um, often or perhaps for vexatious reasons. Um, but the, the architecture around it requires both sides to get involved and, and to try and fix the problem before it becomes a problem. Um, so, it, and then, you know, if, if it does come, come down to it, um, the UK could be faced with a choice. Um, do we block this regulation in Northern Ireland using the storm and break? Or do we say, well, why don't we stay kind of closely aligned with the EU in order for this not to be a problem in Northern Ireland? So an, an example of where that might come up would be um, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, C CBAM as it's called. So basically um, a, a big new climate related piece of regulation in the EU is, is to make sure that stuff isn't being imported into the EU that has a big carbon footprint from, from a third country. Um, could that affect goods coming from Great Britain into Northern Ireland? Uh, it's possible. Um, this gets this gets into very technical areas around um, emissions trading systems and whether the EU has one that's or the UK has one that's similar to the EU. Um, but it's it's again it's it's an area where problems could could be solved or could could come up. Um, but but you're going to get down to this ultimately this this big question: Does the UK want to jeopardize the relationship now that the relationship is doing so well? Um, will they want to pull this lever often? Um, or will they want to avoid it? And it seems to me that the 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 way it's structured, it's almost rigged to to such a degree that it's not going to be triggered very often, um, and and that problems can be solved uh, before they become big problems. So I'll, I'll leave it there, and then happy to take questions. I'll, I'll sit down for that. <laughs>